Now, I read somewhere that you grew up until you were 13 in the UK. Is that, am I yeah. right in saying that? Is, is there anything, did that shape you musically at all? Um, I think more so. I mean, in England, there was a lot of Brit pop stuff that I was listening to beforehand, like Arctic Monkeys and, uh, I mean, Razorlight was out then and there was like Libertines, Baby Shambles and sort of all that, those kind of bands of Franz Ferdinand. But I think they were sort of worldwide anyway at that time. But uh, sure. I think moving to Perth, I felt like, obviously the Perth local scene was huge when I sort of was old enough to go out here. Uh, I feel like that shaped me a bit more. So, yeah, I feel like I'm more of an Australian now than I am an English expat. So. <laughs> yeah, because I, I wonder, your style and, and kind of the, the type of music suits, I, I would say the warmer climate of Australia a lot better <laughs> as well. Um, but what was it that got you started then? Because I, I did read that, you, that your dad had quite a record collection that you delved into. What kind of got you off the ground? Yeah, I think, well, he was always like, he'd come over from the pub and just slap on a record. And I think that for me just felt like it was like synonymous with like good times. So like if you were sort of like, I don't know, no matter what, like when they'd come back from the pub or if it was like having a barbecue outside, or, then there'd always be a record playing. And I think it was always kind of like uh, Beatles was always on, Rolling Stones, like UFO, Zeppelin, Black Sabbath. It was always kind of like guitar-based heavy music. But I mean, he always had like Stevie Wonder and like loads of like Motown and everything. So okay. uh, I think I was just more like the riffs. I just remember hearing like, I think it was Motorhead, like Ace of Spades for like first time. Like, oh my God. Like, and then just wanting to sort of capture that sort of raw feeling of like heavy music. So and I've always sort of, I know, I remember he gave me a bass guitar, which was way too big for me. And I played bass back when I was really young. Uh, and our parents actually paid for us to go to a studio in like Wolverhampton, which was about 40 minutes drive. for like, there was our Christmas present to record. Okay. Like three. I think we were like 11 or 12. Okay. I've still got this it's ridiculously bad, but it's a, it was, you can see us just like smiling that, yeah, it was, uh, it was just fun to be in the studio. So the seed was think, planted already, I suppose. Yeah, I think since then I've just been hooked and been like, all right, that's it. Music has always been like a hobby, but I mean, now, yeah, it's completely more than that. It's just life encompassing. You're just like, right. Oh. And uh, I don't know when you last uh, listened to those songs, but what did you hear in it? Oh, man, there was actually some cool riffs. Like, there was like a lot of, uh, we didn't know any tunings back then, so it was all in mm. standard, like, <laughs> tuning, like, but our guitar player, so I was on bass, but the guitar player didn't know any chords, so it'd all just be on the uh, low E string, it's just like riff, like almost kind of like really, really dull down Rage Against the Machine kind of sounds. But uh, yeah, I think it was interesting listening back to it and be like, wow, I still kind of got that style of like no chords, just all, all riffs. So. And uh, am I right in saying that you stopped playing the guitar for a while because kind of nobody in your uh, immediate environment was, was into that type of music? Yeah, like for a long time. I think that was like 20, maybe as soon as I left school, uh, well, that would have been 2009. And then until about 2012, I just bought, someone bought me a, it's actually here, the old uh, machine micro, you know, the okay. little launch pad. Mm. So I just started like sampling and getting like drum machines and just going to town with that and sort of playing, just mucking around. I was really into like, uh, that guy fours and free the robots and obviously like uh uh dj shadow and sort of uh, massive attack and all those kind of bands that were sort of doing it more i don't know there was so much music to sort of go to but then as soon as i sort of came back to australia after uh like a trip away i think that was about 2012 was sort of when i started playing guitar again and uh getting back into like bands and just jamming with people. And then it wasn't until I met Rich, where I, like who's in the uh, band now, that sure. it really was like, all right, cool. Let's actually start a project. So, Yeah, what was that like? Because I, I also read that it kind of started as a project for university, but then it kind of slowly developed into something more. What initially, was it just kind of a thing to have fun with, with a group of guys? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. And I think that writing a song would be like something that would just be this procrastination. So I didn't have to do any uni work. I'd be up all night <laughs> and be like, like a, like a riff or something like that or a drum note or 
whatever. And then I'd be like, shit, like my project's due in like two days. Like, all right, okay, I've got to, uh, got to hone in on this. But I think as well, like I've been thinking about it because now obviously sort of got a bit more of a luxury of time to be like, I can record whenever I want. But mm. I think there was something nice about when you were, when we were younger, when it, we were like working like full-time jobs and we had not a lot of time. So you were like, this song is going to be, 10 minutes or whatever, it's going to be eight minutes long because you want to work on that one song so much. Whereas mm. now you get to the point where you're like, three minutes is good. I, I want to work on another one. I want to work on another one. It's like, I don't know, it's strange having too much time almost. Yeah, whenever I speak to musicians and I've also read a, a lot of rock and roll uh, autobiographies, it always seems like those initial years are kind of the most magical where you're starting to figure things out, where, where you're starting to figure your sound out. How was that for you, those initial years of the band? Oh, man, I'm still trying to figure out our sound. I think okay. uh, it's getting to the point now where it's like, I don't want it to loop it into a spiral. It'd be nice to sort of head outwards and be like, all right, cool. They're kind of coming out of their shell a bit more. But um, definitely, I feel like we had a chat the other day about do we put samples in for the live set? Because there's a lot of that stuff on the album. And we were like, no, nah, I think it could become more a bit of a, not a gimmick, but like it, you kind of don't want to take away from that raw, just guitars, drums, bass and vocals. So mm. that. Uh, to add like the electronic kind of aspect would almost, it feels like cheating somehow, but I mean, uh, I'm sure we'd get away with it if we wanted to, but um, for the sound, it's like, I, I suppose just whatever we can come up with, like, or whatever I, I'm into at the moment. But saying that, the stuff that I've been writing heaps at the moment, which is like, I can't put it on an album. It's just like, it doesn't sound anything like <laughs> porn crunk. It's not just like, what am I going to do with these songs? And not that I want anyone to hear them, but it's like, it kind of, after, like you're like all right well they'll just sit on a computer now and not be listened to so mm. maybe one day i'll put them all out but it's like i know you've got to try and find that headset of where the porn conference kind of is right well let me uh, uh, let's delve into creativity a little bit more then because what do you get out of that and then like you said it doesn't even have to be for an audience but what do you get out of, the, out of that process of creation um, I think for me, it's just like a sense of like achievement. I think like, you know, even if you just like make your bed in the morning, you're like, all right, I've achieved one thing or I've done this, I've done that. It's like, I think just finishing a song feels like it wasn't there before in the, in the universe and now it's here. It's like, it's a thing. Unless you've completely just ripped someone <laughs> off and just retwisted their song. It's like, hopefully you've made something new. So I think that for me is like the greatest kind of achievement, but then I, I generally prefer the demos of the songs compared to when we go in the studio and then finish it and then it's on the record. It's like, I listen to the demos of the album now rather than finish things. I'm like, oh, there's too many mistakes. Whereas like on the uh, demo, it's like all mistakes, but I'm like, all right, I can hear where it's going to go. It's going to go there. It's like, I can never finish anything. It's hard. Well, like you said, and especially being uh, at home all the time uh, this last year and having all that time on your hands, um, you can fret over all those little things. So, so has that been <laughs> difficult as you were making this album? Yeah, for sure. I think I've probably spent too much time thinking about what it's going to sound like and then went into this really crispy, condensed, <laughs> compressed world. Whereas I probably should have just thought about the idea a bit more. So I don't know. I think there was a, there's a balance. And I'm always trying to find out with production, I think, where you, you can either think about it too much or like, but I think there was a definite feel for the record, which I was happy with it overall. It sounded like, like all those songs kind of were meant to be on that record. So um, and I feel like that was, I hadn't felt like I'd achieved that before on a record. So and, and, and obviously each record we hopefully will build upon and then the next one will get better and the next one mm -hmm. will slowly get better. But, uh, and I think it's always going to be, well, I'll try and do something completely different. So now it's like, put down the spangly guitars and the uh, sort of um, the Mellotron. And I've been sort of getting down in the drop B tunings and trying to figure out some sort of metal heavier stuff. So it's heading in that direction. But, but so is that uh, kind of early experience you had with electronic music, does that help now? Yeah, definitely. I think from using Ableton, like um, that for me felt like uh, all those glitch guitar sounds you can sort of mm -hmm. hear on was just sort of using the Ableton and putting the guitars into more electronic worlds and 
shifting them up an octave and kind of keeping them in like beats mode and uh, trying to uh, quantize them in weird ways where it would syncopate differently. So, right. I mean, that's like, rather, I mean, that's completely electronic. So there I'm saying, like, I don't want to be electronic when we're playing live, but when it, in the studio, it's like, all right, let's fuck everything up. But, I, I, I have you attempted to, to translate it to a live uh, version yet? I've been speaking to people about how to do it, but I just, I wouldn't know how. I think because mm. it needs like a real time, I, I wouldn't want to not play the guitar parts, but I wouldn't want to launch them either. So it's like, I, I've been trying to find someone that could build sort of like a glitch pedal, mm. but it has to glitch it in real time. And I don't know how that, it's like, I mean, there's reverse things. There are certain glitch pedals that sound really cool, but like, I'd have to do it with a pitchfork or maybe like a pog so I can step right. it up or something. When it comes to the record, that, well, because um, I read that most of it was uh, written and recorded uh, in your house. Uh, did the whole process start up before or uh, kind of as Corona was, was taking over? Um, it was before. Okay. Like we was, um, I was writing a lot of the tracks in November, December, and then we were away touring for a bit and we sort of got home around february and i think that was like march time was when our manager was like all right we need the record finished and i was just like no like it's not even close to being finished <laughs> and I could get away for like the whole year i don't know like i feel like i just needed some time to chill and sort of get my ideas across because it was all like i don't know I'd, i'd find that when you're on tour you're so far away from your instrument that when you come home it's like You just want to write or like blurt out as much as you can. So it might be like an acoustic song, it might be mm. this song, it might be that song. Like I was jumping back onto just making beats or whatever. Um, and it wasn't so much that I wanted to write a porn crumpets record. I just wanted to make music. So I think um, once COVID sort of hit, I was like, oh, thank God. Like, not obviously thank God, because that was still <laughs> No, but I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. <laughs> but for me, it was a... Uh, a just a breath of fresh air that I could actually be like, spend some time mm. to working on this record. And so songs like, I remember writing, is it Maggot Terrarium, um, uh, Trapolosaur and Sawtooth Monkfish, all in like the space of a week. And it was like, <laughs> all right, that's the, sound. Like, that's the sound I want. And and then I'd sort of work on them a bit more. But it, it, I was like, I don't know, there'd always be like little periods or patches of time where I felt like I couldn't write anything. And I think that, to give yourself a deadline is a good thing, but also mm. I don't think for an album, I think like maybe once you've got the ideas, give yourself a deadline to get it mixed and mastered. But the writing, I feel like it's so important that I'd much rather spend a year working on something that sounds great than three months working on something you're like, I don't like it. And then you have to tour it and then you have to pretend you love it. Uh, yeah, for me, Shiger felt like the one thing that, apart from the first record was the most time I've ever had to spend on something. Mm. Yeah, and I'm really happy with it. But now I like, could overanalyze it. And <laughs> but, yeah. is, is it a very solitary process that in a sense for you, especially the initial parts of it? Yeah, for sure. I think like, um, I don't know, right? I'm, literally, this is, my, this is my room. I've just got, right. that's the only thing I have. I've just got some guitars, some amps down here, my pedal. I'm going to jam in a minute, but it's so tiny. It's like, <laughs> All I have is the Apollo twin and everything else over on the other side is just broken material that, that's uh, been dead. But yeah, I basically would just sit in here, wake up, make a cup of tea, uh, jangle out some ideas. And then if I'm like, oh, that kind of sounds good, just go straight into the DI, make some programmed drums or whatever goes towards it, and then try and put the bass to it, vocals, until it's sort of the demo feels like, it's enough to show everyone. And then once it gets to that point, we're like, sweet, let's use that. And then um, usually it's finished by then. So <laughs> that, that moment when you show your kind of ideas to the band, what is that like for you? Oh, it's horrible. It's, uh, <laughs> well, Rich, the guitar player is like, he's a music, music person. Like he doesn't like anything with a pop hook at all. <laughs> like, yeah, he listens to like Yusuf Kamal and like, floating points and like it's like for him it's like all right it's got to be epic so um whereas danny kind of likes a bit more i suppose a bit of indie music but he's also a jazz fiend so mm. every time i do show people it's hard because you'd like even the people in the band won't get it like mm. i don't know sometimes like i remember showing 
I mean, there's so much material that they don't literally like that will, won't make the record, but uh, that no one will hear. But I don't know. Maybe one day I can be like, this is all the stuff <laughs> people don't like, but I love. So. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> What, what is that um is, is it just a question of like you said just sitting down experimenting and just just trying things out and, and trying to reach a point where of, of something that you like yeah for sure i think that for me like uh because i always like 10 seconds of music or something or like the original mm. riff or like whatever and then at the moment it's like i've been sort of being like well does it need a verse, does it need a chorus, does it need this standard pro like uh, progression or whatever? So I don't know, I've sort of, like I've scrapped songs that I love 95% of it, but if 5% sounds bad, mm -hmm. I don't feel like going back to it. Cause I'm like, oh, like I can't, I'll get to it and cringe and go, oh, I don't like that part. And then I'll write something else. But what I've been doing at the moment is sort of maybe a year later, I'll be like, oh, that's sort of similar to something I had before. And then seeing if I can sort of sandwich the bits that I like from those songs together. So I suppose nothing does go to waste. It's almost just like yeah. a, uh, yeah, re like a recycling tip of uh, bits and pieces that, like the iTunes is just filled with all these either right. five minutes, 30 songs, or they could be 30 <laughs> seconds. But I'm like, I'll export that. I'll put it into the bank. And so. Right. Well, the, you're talking about riffs. There's, um, let's see which uh, puke bug i think it was uh, no it was um mundungus that riff where, where did that come from oh the mundungus riff i have no idea hey i think that like uh i remember watching that like there was a 1920s like jazz band on youtube or something and i remember just watching um who's that drummer it was like the guy it might be the purdy shuffle or something like that or um i don't know but they, it was just sick it was just like <laughs> this amazing group and it felt like so, uh, I don't know, just ludicrous that they were playing this instruments and no one was kind of hitting any notes that made sense to me. And I was like, all this jazz stuff. So I was just like trying to make something that sounded uh, kind of goofy, but kind of like uh, rocking still. And I feel like that uh, Mundungus, it had that kind of vibe to it where it's just like, you can't not smile to that track. You're like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's just silly. But I think that, yeah, I like that about it. But yeah, then as as we mentioned, um, I think even before the interview, it's it's very full. It's very full on the, the album. Um, was that kind of by design? Yeah, I think so. Like there was sort of an idea previously to make it sound like chaotic and hectic, kind of like a mm. tour schedule. So when we were on tour, it'd be like, wake up, do it all over again, get drunk, and go play a show, <laughs> and then sleep, and then go out and do it all. Like, it was kind of like that moving circle of tour life that I feel like I was trying to capture. So um, yeah, for me, sorry, I keep getting people cool. The, for me, I feel like the album, it needed to be fast paced and hectic and like, uh, mm -hmm. but there was probably times where I felt like it slowed down for me. Sure. And then other people, oh, like it's, got, it's come <laughs> straight back. Yeah. No, but I do think, um, let's see which one that was. Uh, I think the final track, the tale of uh, Gurney Gritman, that's one that kind of starts very in your face and then kind of slowly opens up in a way and kind of slows yeah. down a little bit. So, so yeah, like you said, there is that sense of dynamics. And, and... It was just the last song. <laughs> 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 um, well, when do, when do the lyrics come in for you and then in particular this last year i suppose for for everybody it's been a maybe maybe not for everyone but for a lot of people it's been a year a year of reflection looking back on your life because you have the time to do so um where do where the lyrics and the themes come in um i think a lot of it was I, it, probably tour life like um mm. basically i think that whole dynamic it was supposed to be sort of like the drunk narration of like your kind of post tour life so getting home and being like oh my god like what actually just happened there and trying to piece together look i mean there's sometimes when people are like oh like or rich will be like someone were talking about Liechtenstein or austria or something about oh how was that and they're like we're in this town they're like didn't you go there i was like fuck we were there like i just i don't know it was literally can't remember like half of europe or half of like the tour we went on because we were just in a tour van in transit kind of doing that so 
you kind of wake up in the middle of the night and go, ah, like, fuck, that happened. All right. So <clears throat> I think when recording, that kind of felt like a nice lyrical topic to, to choose. And mm -hmm. it was like almost a concept album on us being the concept. So it was kind <laughs> of first person, but trying to write it a little bit uh, tongue in cheek so it didn't sound like our lives were difficult or anything. It was like still fun. And I think we're trying to keep that fun element there. But um, it, yeah, it, it just felt like I could write about that easy. As most people say, like, write about what you know about. So uh, that for me felt the normal thing to do. Well, a, a kind of, uh, I don't know if dissecting is the right word, but looking into the touring life and, and kind of everything that, that it entails. What have you realized about yourself and, and kind of the band as a touring band? Or being on tour? Um, I, I don't know. I suppose, like, I think it feels like such a different world now that mm. we live in. The tour is, like, almost back when we... I mean, I felt younger. It was weird. I feel like mm. even though we've been like a year, I feel like just being home and being able to get uh, sort of my brain together and sort of feel like, all right, what is life and what is my job and what's happening and what is music. And I think when we were on tour, it felt like so fast that you couldn't really get a breath a lot of the time. And you sort of just uh, assume that what you're doing is good because people are coming to your shows. But it's like in retrospect, it might just be getting awful and you'd never really know because you're just constantly playing these arenas and not sort of, or playing like 200 cap rooms or whatever. But I think it, you need some sort of time to really focus like, mm. and be like, what do I like about music and what do I like? And I think um, being on tour, it was, it was nice that we had a good group of people with us. And I think all of us like really close friends that it never, there's never a hard moment. Like sometimes you bawl your eyes out like in the back <laughs> of a van or whatever, because you're absolutely hung over or coming down or whatever. But like everyone will be in the same position. So it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. It's a weird, it's like being on a permanent Contiki tour. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you kind of alluded to it already, but uh, there's, there's some talk about uh, substance use and substance uh, abuse, however you want to look at it. Um, and there's, there's this line in, I think it was Mango Terrarium that I wonder what I can do without drugs. <laughs> yeah, I kind of like that lyric. Yeah, yeah well, well I'm, I'm Oh, no, no, go, go ahead, go ahead. Where, where did that lyric kind of come from? Why did that pop into your head? I think because before it's like the younger me would sort of use that as a tool to create. And then I suppose that now I was like, well, what if I didn't take all those drugs? <laughs> like, could, would the music be better? And it's like, is it just your brain or is there something in whatever you're doing, like psychedelics or weed or however you use it's like, yeah. Mm -hmm to create it's like but sometimes you do need a different viewpoint or whatever so but man i haven't touched anything in yonks like okay it's just a bit like, it's just yeah i feel like i don't know I've, on the sober train at the moment which has been really nice i still drink still drink and smoke but not like weed so it's like but then i feel like using that every once a year i'll have like a week where i might like have like literally two doobies and I'll just be like, oh, all right, now can do it. like all brand new again. So I just feel like instead of kind of overusing it, just maybe if I'm struggling, all right, all right okay, now I've got these sort of uh, other patches of thought that I can sort of enter if I need to. But at the moment, it feels nice just being sober. So, yeah, but there's a, there is a lyric. I, I, I... I kind of written, written this down a bit weird, but I ain't being sober no more. There, I think it's either Mango Terrarium or Mandungus. Uh, so, oh, so that... Yeah, well, that, that was a kind of a joke song. Okay. But the, because uh, the whole thing is about when you get, when we got home, everyone was like, are you okay? Like, do you, do you need any help or whatever? And you're like, no, I'm fine. Like, <laughs> and I think, like, don't realize that you're probably you probably are acting a bit sporadic. And I mean, every night when we got home, it's like, you can't just fit back into normal kind of mm. routine. It's like, cause you're so used to being at the pub. It's like when we got home like that night, I remember everyone just sitting there, we got off the plane. I was like, fuck, I need to go to the pub. Who wants to go to the pub? We're all just like addicted to just going out and like drinking. So I think that, uh, or just having fun and being, feel like you're around an environment that's still up. So uh, and I think because we were going out quite a bit that even when you talk to your parents or whatever, it was just like, 
it, it, it's like that call and response of like, mm. are you okay? No, I don't want to be sober no more. <laughs> I, is this fine? No, it was like just kind of just stupid, like a kid talking to his parents like a sport brat. I feel like that. It's, there's a lot like that in Tripolisor as well. Mm. It, I'm getting getting used to waking up and feeling rough, and and then it's like I don't understand why though. And I think that uh, you're just like, what are you doing? I think in that it was writing about how pathetic we must have seemed to other people, but uh, now we're older. Now we can make real <laughs> grown up decisions. No, but at, at the same time, and and being older, you, you mentioned that in a couple of songs as well, uh, or or kind of. Uh, I don't know about like gaining more wisdom as you grow older, but there was this one line, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's something along the lines of um, every old old guy tells me enjoy every day. Um, so like you yeah. mentioned before, that, that sense of enjoyment, especially considering the world, uh, the state of the world as it is now, uh, how difficult is it to, to find those to, that enjoyment? Yeah, I think I think it's important. I just remember being, that that was generally like real. It was like we were in a pub in England, and they were just like, I don't know everyone does that. You just get some old bloke, and they just be like, Mate, enjoy every day, like make sure you have fun. You just like it's just kind of nice. It's just humbling that you're like, mm. all right, sweet, get yeah, on do it. But I suppose like enjoy every day doesn't mean like you have to be like it's my last day ever. <laughs> it's kind of like just have fun. I think for me, just enjoyment right now, it's like. Uh, getting to the point where I can record, but also not have to release it. I think that's something mm. that feels like, it's just, I can make music. I can do do that without it feeling like I'm going to be judged by it. I love making bad songs. I think everyone <laughs> loves making bad songs. It's like, it's a, uh, I've got some horrible, like old Blink 182, Sub 41 tracks that I just like, can't wait to just be like, all right, I'm starting this pop punk band and we're, we're going to town. But yeah, the rest of the boys would probably kill me if they ever got out. But uh, I don't know. It's just, it's nice. I feel like at the moment I was pretty much a recluse for a long time when I was recording because I spent so much time in isolation. I suppose everyone's feeling that now. So it's kind of nice just talking to friends again and mm. getting a, some sort of relationships that weren't when we were away for a long time. Now I can sort of rekindle them and go out. And we're fortunate enough here that the pubs are open. So right. yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's felt good. I can just go go out yeah no, i was gonna say it's probably different because here everything is still close and uh, i haven't seen some of my friends for over a year which is which is a bit strange but, no, it's so nuts. but uh, finally then because what i do here in the record and we kind of talked about it maybe already but it does feel like a very even, even though it might be tricky to translate it to life it, it's sounds like an album that will do well live i mean will, that will get the energy going so uh, how far along are you in in terms of um both playing again because i don't know what the situation is in australia but also in terms of um, how much you yourself need that touring or need that moment of uh yeah that, that hour on stage every so often uh, i would be happy never touring again <laughs> no but i <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like playing, but I feel like, I don't know, much more like just relax now. Like mm. I'd, I'd rather go on stage with a cup of tea and acoustic guitar and just be like, <laughs> I'm not even, I don't even want to do that. I, I, I don't know, maybe like a Daft Punk suit and just get into the full, like as uh, strange as the electro world. But uh, we've been we've been fortunate that we've been able to have shows since last August. So okay. everything okay. yeah, everything's sort of going ahead in Australia at the moment. And I think we're having interstate travel is now back on so bands from over in melbourne and sydney can come over to perth and we can go over there but uh it's sort of like i think everyone's still kind of keeping their wits about them because if there's one mm. case like then we have to do two weeks of quarantine so it's like the whole state goes into lockdown just over like literally one case right. so it's like so at the moment i think the whole of australia has zero cases which is pretty good so uh, it's amazing it's ridiculous if, if you compare that to the rest of the world the, the way australia and uh, new zealand are handling this thing it's it's it, it puts the rest of the world to shame i think uh, well i think they've done a good job it's, it's nice but i don't know maybe they're just not even testing anyone maybe <laughs> got and nobody's noticing just just uh, <laughs> going on with their lives yeah. final question then um the the title uh, I don't know even how to pronounce it Shiga or Shiga Shiga um, yeah where did that uh, come from 
Uh, I was just listening to a lot of Godspeed You Black Emperor yeah. and they just had an exclamation mark in the name. I just thought that was brilliant. Like, and it already gave like an emotion, like evoked an emotion just by being like, Godspeed You. Like, and so I just kind of wanted that and just came up with a word. I just, it doesn't mean anything. It's just <laughs> like, shut with something like that. It just sounded like it was a, like Eureka, like kind of like this uh, fun, fun word to say. So. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, Jack. It was a pleasure talking to you and uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Robert. Cheers for having me on. No, no you're uh, most welcome.